Okay. Check, check. Okay. So now I want to go back to the original CR2 file. The DNG file has actually done its work, so you can actually throw him away. We don't need that guy anymore. Um, I take that back. Don't throw him away yet. So if you're throwing him away, pull him back out of your trash, we might use him for something else really quick. However, I did want to show you the location of where these are. So if we go to our Canvas site, uh, again, I've made you guys somewhat aware of this last time, but I just want to make you aware of it again. If you'll do this with me, it'll be easier just to help you to remember where to find it. So go to our Canvas site. And let's go back to session one, the module for session one. And in the session one resources, Remember there was a thing in here that had Photoshop CC preference locations. I want you to click on that to open it up because this will give it to you for both Windows and for Macintosh. So Macintosh is the first group. It's the setting that's sitting right up here. And I'm going to come to, I'm going to come down here and what I'm looking for are the, is the location for those custom profiles that we're actually making. So I'm going to continue to come down. And of course, it's not in here. Let me look up at the top again. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. Okay, I will find it for Windows. It actually might be in the color checker passport. I'll find it before we finish class. Um, uh, well, no, we got to find it now because you guys are going to need to actually show this. So Let's wait till the end of class. We'll figure this out together. Um, but I'll show you where it is for Macintosh. And we'll at least go that far. So you remember last week we created the user library for yourself and parked it over in your uh, side part. Remember, to, to get to it, if you didn't keep a, 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 um, a shortcut to it, it's in your finder. You go to the Go menu. If you click on the Go menu, you do not have your library. But depending on your model of Macintosh, you hold down either the Shift key or the Option key, and you get Library. It sits right here. So I'm going to click on Library. Once I get to the library so that I don't have to remember that keyboard shortcut, you can simply click on the little icon of the folder at the top of the library window and drag it over to your favorites and let go, and it'll sit over here forevermore. And then once you are there, you come into Application Support, then into Adobe, then into Camera Raw, then into Camera Profiles. And there it's sitting right here, the one that we just made. So this is the one. It should be named exactly the way you named it, and it should have the .dcp next to it. Did you have a .dcp next to yours? Yeah, so, okay. Um, so anyway, it's in the right spot. So again, for you to actually turn this in, you do not want to remove it. Let me get rid of another one in here so that you don't see it. You do not want to take this out and put this on your desktop to actually uh, um, turn in, because once you take it out, it's no longer available to you. So I'm going to hit Command-Z to undo that and hopefully go back to the camera profiles. Instead, if you drag this to your desktop, sorry, and hold down the Option key before you let go, you'll see your, get the, your cursor turns into a little plus. And what that'll do is then put a copy of that on your desktop, and you can turn that in for your assignment. Are we good on this part? Okay. 
Uh, again, this will be in the video recorded, so if you get a little bit lost in that, whatever. And we will find out where this same exact location is uh, for the people who are doing Windows. Okay, so to use this thing, Go back to the original CR2 file, so the one that we used to make the DNG. So again, I'm going into my student files number two inside the custom DNG profile example files, and you want to launch the CR2 file into Photoshop, however you need to do it, whether you need to right click it or whatever, you need to actually get it in there. So, has everybody got this image back up into Camera Raw? All right, so to use this thing, in the older versions of Camera, uh, camera Raw, um, this was not as important to Adobe. It was always there, but this part was buried pretty deep inside of Camera Raw. You had to go into different places to find it. It has become so important and critical to people, it's actually the very first option that you have right after Auto and Black and White. It is Profile that's sitting right up here. If you click this drop down for profile, you will see that there is an Adobe Color, Landscape, Portrait, Standard, Vivid, Monochrome, and then you can browse. This Adobe Color is, Adobe is actually generated, Adobe goes out, it, it, I know this seems hard to believe, but it's true. They go out and they buy like 10 or 20 versions of every camera that there is, and they run this same very same software that we are running right now to build a general profile. They average all the numbers together, and then they give you this. And Adobe is smart enough, I mean, this camera program is, look, it, it's smart enough to know that this was an, ES, uh, uh, an ES5D Mark II. So this is the generic profile for an ESD, uh, for, uh, I'm sorry, an EOS 5D Mark II Canon camera. However, it's generic. It is not specific to my camera. And in our world, it's like being a little pregnant. There's no such thing. It's either the perfect profile for it or it isn't. And so these custom profiles are critical. I do not work without them. So we need to actually then use the profile that we just made. To get to it, the easiest way is to, if you look just to the right of the word that says profile in that drop down menu, it looks like there's a set of little four squares with a magnifying glass. If you click on that, it will actually open up the profile browser. Now, inside of here, there is a set of canned profiles. These are the ones that we were just looking at. You do not actually have to select one to see what its effect is. If you simply hold your cursor over like the Adobe Monochrome, it'll show you what that one is. Now, again, if I come off of it because I didn't select it, in order to select something, you would actually have to click on it. And you can see the Adobe Color one is highlighted right now. If you start to scroll down, what you'll see is down at the bottom, there is another set of possible profiles. There is camera matching and then just the word profiles. And then artistic, black and white, modern, vintage, whatever. These are all basically glorified Instagram filters. But the one that we care about is going to be under profiles. If you open up the drop down menu for profiles, you should see the profile that we actually just created for this. Does everybody have it? Okay, do not select it. What I want you to do is zoom in to the color card, and I just want you to hover over it. Just put your, don't select it, just put your cursor over it, and then take it off, and then put it back on, and then take it off. And look at the color shift that's actually happening. Look at the color shift that actually happens in her sweater. Her sweater takes on a lot more red and magenta, and it's also much less saturated. Look at the blue patch on the color checker, and you'll actually see when you hover over this, <clears throat> the blue patch actually becomes much darker. Um, and you can see if you back out, so zoom back out, and again, cover over, hover over and come back and forth, look what it does to the trees, the green of the trees, all of this. This is massive, and there is no way you as an individual would know how perverted your file actually is from the color it gave you in terms of the color it should have been. Does this make sense to everyone, what's going on? So our first step is to apply the profile. Simply click on it, and it will actually apply the profile. Then you think this is color balanced. It's not. What we just did, if you look at what was happening here, let me undo that part. I'm going to go back to my Adobe Color. Let me show you what's really going on. 
What's really happening, to explain this to you in a nutshell, I'm going to go back and forth again on top of these to see. You see it makes that blue considerably darker. What that's telling me is that my sensor is too sensitive to blue light. It actually registered more blue light than is really there. And that was the biggest perversion in what's happening with my sensor. So this profile starts removing some of that blue and that's why this thing, that's why the blue patch actually gets darker. It's taking away that sensitivity to it. It's then neutralizing it and making a device independent. Are we good on that part? Now, I don't need to keep yelling at you guys. I can actually put this back on. Uh, okay. So is this making sense to everyone what's going on? However, at the end of the day, this is correcting for the deficiency of the sensor. That's got nothing to do with white balancing. White balancing is still white balancing and you still do it. So I'm applying the profile, but then to white balance, you can actually, you know, again, we need to collapse out of this whole thing. So up at the very top of your menu, right under the histogram, next to the word where it says profile, there's a back arrow. If you click on that, it will actually collapse that, um, uh, uh, that open dialog box so that we can start working with the rest of our tools. And the next tool that you're going to go for is the white balance eyedropper. You simply click on this white balance eyedropper and then come over. And this happens to me all the time. And I think this is a bug. When I click on my uh, eyedropper, I can't get it to stick unless I do it like a couple of times. It always wants to be the magnifying glass, but now it's sticking. You want to pick something in your uh, image that should be a neutral color. So in this case, I've actually got neutral colors that are already built into it. It's the whole bottom row of patches. However, you don't want to pick a white patch or even the lighter of the two, the one that's right by the blue and the one that's right by the green. You don't want to pick those because the problem is this is actually going to put a correction curve on this to balance this out. And the way white balancing works, and this goes back to our original color theory lecture last week, by definition, equal amounts of RGB equal neutral gray. So if you take a look at the values that we've actually got, I'm hovering over mine. If you look up at your histogram right now, you'll see that as I hover over the, I use the patch that's right next to the red. So that's just underneath the red. That's the gray that I actually pick. You don't want to do the ones that are too light um, uh, because you don't have enough room to actually do the color correction up in something that's that light. It would be like trying to actually use a point on a curve in Photoshop really near the white point to do your color balancing. You would never do it there. You usually want to stay more in the middle and that's what we're doing here. You also don't want to go down in the really lower, deeper colors because color casting doesn't really show up in shadows and deeper colors. It's usually in the mid quarter tones is where you really pick it up. So that's why I'm going to use this color patch. If you look at the color value in my histogram, it says that I've got a red of 199, a green of 203, and a blue of 203. If you actually click on that patch, you'll now see that they all three say 203. That is how white balance occurs. It neutralizes something that, again, it makes the whatever you click on have equal values of RGB. Now to see how that really works, if you actually use your color picker to click on the red patch, and you'll see your image turns radically blue, and it's the reason it's turning radically blue is it's actually trying to add enough blue to balance out this red. However, it's even it's not strong enough. You can see you don't get to those equal values of RGB up at the very top. It simply doesn't have the capacity to actually do that. But now if I come back down to that little square that's right underneath it and click on that, it actually goes back to a normal, uh, uh, gives me the same value. In this case now I've got a 204, 203, 203, but actually close enough. I want you to pervert your color one more time by clicking on that red patch, and then I want you to zoom back out. If I didn't have this color card in here, could I neutralize and white balance my image? Is there anything in my image that should be a neutral gray? Actually, surprisingly, the black shirt does work, but I'm looking for something that, again, I'm trying to stay away from the more shadow end of it. I'm trying to stay up in those mid-tones, quarter tones. Possibly the concrete. That might work, so let's try it. You're talking about the street? Yeah, yeah so let's try it. Come on. I'm glad yours works. I can't get mine. Oh, 
works reasonably well, right? Is there anything else you could use? I wouldn't use the street necessarily myself. Streets can actually have color cast to them as well. Anything that I know for certain would be neutral. How about the license plate on the car? Shouldn't that be white? Color. I actually like the warmth that it puts into it a little bit. Um, there's also, oh wait, the bus sign. What about the bus sign? We would know that would be. What about the no parking sign that's right there? That would also be a neutral gray. So would the bus sign, actually. You guys need to leverage yourself and take advantage of the type that's actually in the banner that's hanging back behind the trees should also be a neutral gray and a neutral white in there. So there's a number of things in here. Like I said, the shirt actually surprisingly will give you a relatively neutral gray. But in our case, we're actually using this. But the point that I'm trying to make is there is a difference between correcting for the perversion of your sensor the device dependence of your sensor and color balancing the image. Does this make sense to everyone? Okay, so this part works out great. Again, I don't know why I've got a, a, a Adobe Vivid on mine for my color checker, so I'm gonna go back to my profiles and give it the right profile. And I'm gonna go ahead and click on this guy, and then I'm gonna hit done on this. And in this case, it is written, uh, this uh, XMP sidecar file here, that should remember that stuff. So I just closed up that file. I want you to open up the CR2 file again into Photoshop. And you should see the profile is sitting right up there. And that part is all great. Does that make sense? OK, I need everybody to watch my screen right now. Don't watch your screen. I just want to show you there is an issue with this. And this is the issue. I'm going to go find that profile that I said had to stay where it was so i'm going to go into again my library application support adobe camera raw camera profiles and i'm going to grab this profile and i'm actually going to put it out i'm going to do just what i told you not to do come on you fucker i'm going to put it onto my desktop um, it says there's another one out there. I'm just going to replace it. I am then going to go back in here and open up my CR2 file again into Camera Raw. And look what happens. I get a warning up here. It knows that there was a profile that was supposed to be for this guy that's been embedded, but it's not here. I just took it out of where it's expected to be on my machine. Now, the same thing will happen to you even if you leave your profiles where they should be. If you put this file on a hard drive and you bring it in here to school to work on it on a different computer, that profile is not going to be on the different computer. Does that make sense to everyone? Are we good on that part? So this is why we saved that DNG. I'm going to show you how to fix this part right now. So I'm going to hit done out of all of this. If I put the profile back in where I took it out of, it, things will work again. So, um, but... I just want you to be aware of this part of it. So where did you go? I'm going to put it back in here again. I'm going to open up the DNG now. So, and I want you guys to do the same thing. Open up your DNG. So the one that we used and open it up into Photoshop. So again, uh, hopefully double clicking on it will simply bring it into Photoshop. And again, up at the very top, this never had the correct profile for it, but I can add the correct profile for it right now. So I'm simply going to click on that, again, the four square box to open up the browser. I'm going to scroll down and open up my profiles. I'm going to click on that DNG, on the correct one, on the one that's actually named. Uh, and I'm going to then simply hit, um, uh, um, actually, before I do that, I'm going to close up the profiles. I am going to do a color balancing because this is also part of your assignment is to actually do the color balance as well. So I'm going to color balance this guy as well. And then I'm simply going to hit done. And it's closed up now. Now, if I double click on the DNG to open it up again, it'll open up into camera raw and you'll see that that correct profile is actually there. 
and I've also got a custom white balance. All of that information gets written into the DNG. I'm going to go ahead and hit done to simply close that up and then I'm going to find that profile again. Here it is in my camera profile folder in the, in the folder where it's supposed to be. I'm going to drag it out to my desktop again that would that created the problem with that CR2. So I'm going to take it out to the desktop but now I'm actually going to double click on the DNG and go back into Camera Raw and it says it's not there. So what's happening now is it's actually picking up the original DNG part of this, which is going to screw me up. So this is the method you're going to have to go through. Go ahead and hit done. Throw this DNG away. Put the profile that we had back in the spot where it belongs. Then click on the CR2 file to launch it. The correct profile should be in there. This time we're going to make a DNG with this in place because it will then write a copy of this profile into the DNG. First I'm going to do a color balance. It is color balanced already. So then I'm going to, at this stage of the game, again, the little box that's at the very top that's got the arrow pointing down in it, click on that. It's already set up to do exactly what you want it to do. Simply hit save. Then we can hit done on this because it's done its work. I've now got a DNG. If I double click on the DNG, it will actually open up and the profile is there. That's all great. Hit done to close that up. But now if I remove the profile from the uh, uh, camera, uh, from, from the camera profile folder. Again, I'm going to put it out on my desktop and then double click the DNG to launch it again. You'll actually see that a copy of the profile was embedded into the DNG and you can work with this for the rest of your life. Does this make sense to everybody what we just went through? I know this is long and just you're just like, Jesus Christ, I can't believe this. This will change everything for you guys. Color managed workflow especially if you're shooting anything, you shoot fashion, you shoot anything that actually really matters that it looks like it's supposed to look. This is the key to it all. Are there questions about this? This is the process. What we just went through is actually a big part of your homework. So are we good on this? Yes. Okay, so this, uh, no, it's a great question. So here's the deal about profiles. Um, the truth of it is your sensor is the perversion we're trying to deal with. It's a deficiency in your sensor. And the deficiency in your sensor exists all the time. It's regardless of, you know, light has an impact on that, though. So the problem is, in theory, you should be able to build a single profile that takes care of any lighting situation because your sensor should be responding to all light the same way. So if, if you correct for it, under tungsten light, it should still be the same correction under uh, fluorescent lights or under daylight or that kind of stuff. But that's not really the case. Light really does have an impact on it. So here's the deal. Um, the profile that you make for your camera is probably 90% of the way there, regardless of whatever light you use it under. So if you didn't have a card uh, to make a profile, a custom profile for that given situation, you would still want to use a custom profile that you had built for a different one because it'll still get you 90% of the way there. But if you really care about your color, you do a profile for every single situation setup that you do. So what does that mean? I go into the studio and I shoot one lighting setup for a week. I don't make a profile for every shot that I do. I don't make one for every day I shoot. As long as my lighting hasn't changed, I've got a profile that's good for the entire week. Um, but uh, the situation, the image that you guys are actually uh, looking at, not this one, but the one where the girl was on the mirror, we started out in the morning and it was really bright, direct sunlight. The, the, the sky clouded over uh, during the afternoon and changed. For me, I saw that as two distinctly different lighting setups and I made a profile for both of those respective ones. But within a shooting, again, if things are not radically changing, you don't need to make different profiles for every one. However, what I will say, because I know a lot of you guys are thinking fashion, is that still true? Yeah, for me, when I shoot, typically a fashion day for me is shooting is anywhere from 12 to 20 outfits a day. That's what I shoot. I do a card for every outfit. Because what ends up happening is that if you do a card for only, say, the first one for that day, 
What happens then when the day gets split apart? What happens when the afternoon goes to one art director and the morning goes to a different art director? Then one of them has the color card to do color correction for everything, but the other group doesn't. So if you've got a color card, and it's just simple, I just stick one in, first frame, hold this, click, done. But I also use it to get, to judge my exposure and to white balance. So again, I don't ever, every single shooting that I do has got one of those cards in it. Does that sort of answer where you're coming from? Okay. Uh, okay, while we are in here, I need everybody to do this. Go ahead and hit done on this. <clears throat> I wanna get out of camera raw really quickly. Um, and I want to open a brand new image, something that we don't have anything done on. So if you take a look at the images that we've been working with here, we've got a CR2 image. That's our RAW file. We've got the DNG. That's uh, Adobe's version of a RAW file. And then we've got this thing called an XMP. It's a sidecar file. What the hell is that? And what's it for? So a sidecar file, here's the thing. Uh, Adobe created digital files. You guys have heard of TIFF, right? Every single TIFF, this is really going to piss you off. Anybody in this room angry about Adobe and all the money that they're taking from you every single year, right? Even if you're here, Adobe's still in your pockets, right? And it's only going to get worse. Um, Adobe invented the digital file format, a TIFF, and Adobe licenses that format to every single camera manufacturer in the world. Every single person in the world uses TIFF. The only difference is they put a small spin on it. There's a little place in the header of the data file about that file, whatever, that they can change something that makes a Canon file a Canon file, or a Nikon file an NEF file, or a, 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 a Sony file an ARW file. It's ARW, right, Sony? Shooters. Anyway, whatever. Every single raw file is actually just a TIFF file from Canon, and every single file that you shoot, Adobe gets paid for. When you buy your camera, they estimate the number of uh, captures your camera is uh, capable of making. It's really a shutter count. For a typical Canon camera, it's about 200,000 captures. A really high end, if you go to the really industrial grade pro level ones, the 1DSs, that kind of stuff, whatever, it's closer to 300,000. So there's an estimation made by Adobe that this camera body will make 300,000 captures and therefore they charge Canon for 300,000 copies of their TIFF file. So you buy a camera, you pay for every single capture that camera is going to make to Adobe and you didn't know it. They're so deep into your pockets, it's ridiculous. But at any rate, when Adobe invented it and Adobe tried to popularize it, everybody was like, oh yeah, digital, that sounds really great, you know, that's really great, you know, but you know, law enforcement comes along and law enforcement says, we won't touch this. And Adobe was like, why not? And they said, well, because you can put his head on her body. I can actually say, I can commit the murder and I can put her head on, on, the, on, the, on the body of the person in the picture who did it, whatever. There's no way, we're not touching this. So Adobe came back to them and said, okay, we'll make you a deal. We'll actually design the file so that any alteration to the file at all, any alteration to the raw file at all will destroy the file. And they said, okay, well, that works. So I ask people this all the time. What can you use to name me an editor for a raw file? Can anybody name me a software that will edit a raw file? There's people say Camera Raw, people say Capture One, people say Bibble, people say, you know, uh, it, there's all sorts of uh, DXO. I mean, there's all sorts of, none of them can edit a raw file. They can process a raw file, but none of them can edit that file. If you go in and you change a single anything inside the file, if you manage to find somebody built software, nobody's actually done it that I know of, um, that would actually change anything the file self-destructs. And that was the way that they could assure the police that a chain of evidence can't be, cannot be corrupted. If, if you have a raw file, that raw file has its integrity. So then how do we process stuff? And so Adobe's answer to that was sidecar files. That's what this XMP file is. It is a text file that describes how you're processing. So inside this text file right now, it's actually got the color temperature that I set when I did that custom color temperature. If I had changed it to black and white, there'd be a note in there that he changed it to black and white. It's basically a recipe of how I did the file. Does that make sense? And if you throw it away, 
you're, you lose all that information. You don't lose the file, but you start from scratch again. Does that make sense? So to show you how that works, double click on the CR2 again really fast. Sorry to go down this road, guys, but you need to know this part right here. I'm getting this warning that this guy is not in here again, that I don't have that, uh, 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 that I don't have my color uh, guy in there, but I'm gonna actually, I've just closed it now, hit done. I'm gonna throw away the XMP file and then double click the CR2 again. And you'll see when I do it again, all of that information that I've done is gone. My color balancing is gone. My profile and the profile warning that it's absent is gone. All of that information was contained in that sidecar file because it is illegal to write anything into the CR2 file. That would be changing that file. So they don't, they actually create these sidecars that are on the side. And that describes how your file is supposed to be processed. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay, did everyone throw away their sidecar file before they opened this thing up? Then close it up, hit done. I need to get to a virgin version of Camera Raw because we need to make some changes there as well. So, and anything that we don't make gets buried into this. So quit it, throw away that XMP file. I don't want to see any XMP file that's close to this guy. Go ahead and empty your trash to make sure you can't do it, and then launch the CR2 again. So there is a problem with the way uh, Camera Raw ships, and, uh, so, and this is where we're gonna actually go look at it and fix it. So before you do anything, because we are gonna create a new set of defaults for Camera Raw, and if you do any change other than the ones I tell you, they're gonna get baked into the, your new defaults. So for instance, if we were to add a two stop exposure to this and then reset that as our default, every single file you open up in, in, in Camera Raw will have two stops extra exposure added to it. You don't want that to happen. But there are two things that you do always want to have happen in my opinion, and I'm gonna show them to you right now. So to get to them, again, you don't want any changes happening at all. You wanna actually collapse the basic panel and you wanna come down to optics i think yes and when you come down to optics you look at the very top do you have remove chromatic aberration checked or not you don't it should be checked you want that for every one of your files so check it you also probably do not have used profile corrections for your lens distortions the one right under it is also not checked check it as well. To see what this lens distortion part is doing, you'll see it picks up the lens information underneath it. Uncheck it and then check it back again and you should see a slight motion in the image. When you check it, it should look like the girl is actually coming out slightly toward you. If you look at the corners of your image as well, you'll notice that the corners also lighten up slightly. What this is doing is it's correcting for the imperfections of the lens. This lens happens to have pin cushioning. It means that the center of the lens appears to be deeper in space than it should. And they use, uh, they use barrel distortion to fix that, to bring it uh, more forward. Again, this is something you would never be able to do. Also in wide angle lenses, historically wide angle lenses vignette heavily at the corners. You guys probably have experienced this. This actually fixes the pin cushioning and barrel distortion as well as the vignetting. So you turn that on. You want these to be on for all of your files. Do you want to go to this thing first on every single file that you do in Photoshop and turn this thing on? That would be absurd. So instead, you go ahead and turn these on. Again, nothing else. You haven't done anything else because anything else you've done is also going to get baked into your new defaults. So once these are all done, the little three dots that are on the far right hand side at the bottom of that tool set, click on that, you'll get a drop down menu and you wanna come down to set raw defaults. And that will open up something we don't care about. So come right back to that guy again. They've changed this since the last time I've actually done this.
fucker. How did you get to that menu? It's these three little dots right here. Oh, All right, they've changed this again as well. No, it's not going to be up here. I will find out where you get to actually save these. This is where it always used to be. And it's no longer in here. Anyway, uh, I'll find it, guys, So that because you want this to be saved as your uh, default here. And then finally, we can hit done on this, and our work on this part is actually done and over, complete. Okay. Moving on, smart objects. We're going to go deep diving into Photoshop now. Uh, how many people in this room know what they are and use them all the time? How many people have no idea what a smart object actually is? OK, so <clears throat> smart object in Photoshop, it's a uh, special layer, for lack of a better way of putting it. And I want you to think of it as this smart object. This is the best metaphor in the world for it. This is an envelope, and it's a protective envelope. And anything that I can put into this protective envelope, so here's my image, and I'm going to put it into here. As long as this thing stays inside this smart object, it is protected. Now, I can do all sorts of things to the smart object. I can distort the smart object. I can filter it. I can do all sorts of things. But what you're seeing is an illusion of that. What's really going on is, is that it's showing you the way an image would look if you transformed it. Let's say you made it 50% smaller or something like that. But the truth of it is that the image on the inside is unchanged. And as long as this thing is unchanged, I can eventually pull it back out if I want to, and this guy will be fine. So that's what smart objects are all about. They are containers. They are an envelope. They are a protective envelope. Make sense? And we're going to look at how we actually use one, and then we're going to look at serious power using... This will be the first real major step into the kind of work that I'm going to expect you guys to do in this class. Um, so at any rate, buckle up. OK, uh, so everybody go into Photoshop. We're just going to start in Photoshop with a generic file. I hit Command N just to bring up the new uh, uh, um, uh, file dialog box. Now again, I use the older version. Yours may not look like mine. I set this up in my preferences. So if I cancel this really quick, in my preferences, remember in preferences under general, I said, use legacy new document interface. I have that checked, so yours may look different than mine. I strongly suggest you use this one, though. It's just so much better, more intuitive. In the drop-down menu that's right next to this, I'm actually going to change my drop-down menu to inches. That'll do it for both of them. I'm going to type in 8 by 10, so I'm just going to do an 8 by 10 file. Again, it, this, this part doesn't really matter. Uh, it is going to be RGB color 8-bit. And the resolution of this, sorry, that was an 8 by 8, 8 by 10, a resolution of 300 uh, pixels per inch. So 8 by 10 inches, 300 resolution, RGB image, 8 bit, and simply say OK to this. And you should have a file that actually opens up and looks just like this. Are we good on this part? Uh, OK. Yeah. That's OK. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to not do this anyway. Close this up. Let's do the car instead. I'm going to do the car instead. Uh, it'll just give us something to work with that, that's easier to see. Close this guy. Uh, if you've made the new file, just close it and don't bother to save it. Uh, and then I want to open up the car again. You can go look for the car. However, if you go up to your file menu instead and come down to Open Recent, you should see a place in here. You should see the red car PSD, and it'll just find it for you. And then go ahead and open up the car. Double click on the hand to actually get it to scale up. So has everybody got a copy of the car open? We good? All right, there is a keyboard shortcut for duplicating a layer. It is Command J. What it really stands for is jump. If you hit Command J, it makes a copy of the car exactly the way the car is, uh, exactly the way it was. It just made a copy of it. So you can think of it really as copy and paste. They call it jump. So you'll hear Command, uh, I'll hit Command J a, a, a lot in here. 
We're going to transform the car. Now, if you haven't gotten into a whole lot of transforming in this class, don't worry about it. We're just going to change the scale of this image. That's all we're going to do here. So to change the scale of the car, the keyboard shortcut for that is Command T. It stands for Transform. If you cannot remember that, it's up at the Edit menu, down to Free Transform, and you'll get to the same place. Again, we have now got, you'll see that there's a set of borders that are around this, transform borders that are around this, and you've got options. And in the options palette up here, I need you to look up here at the top of mine, you'll see that you've got pixel placement, placement. this is actually the size and location, we don't need to worry about that, but we've got the width, that's what the W stands for, we've got the height, and then we've got angle, if we were going to rotate it in there. The thing that I care about most is width and height. You'll notice that right between the two, there is again something that's supposed to look like handcuffs. This is a link. It's really supposed to be a chain link. I mean the handcuff. No, did I say that? I shouldn't have said that. That's just... Wow. Oh, well. Anyway, um, if you click on the link between the two, then when you move one, the other one will move exactly the same way. Again, I use the scrubby slider, so I'm going to simply hover over either the H or the W, and I'm going to drag to the left to make this smaller, and I'm going to go all the way down to 5%. If you can't actually get to 5%, you can actually go in here and simply type in, I just drag across the height and type in a 5. Now, if you look at my screen really quick, look at this right now, you'll see I've typed in the 5, and I've still got a little blue line that's surrounding that. If I hit the Enter key once, it doesn't apply the transform. What it does is it enters that value. If I hit the key a second time, it'll actually apply the transform. And if you turn off the eyeball, on, so go back to our layers palette, the eyeballs that run along the left-hand side are visibility. So if you turn off the eyeball of the bottom layer, you'll actually see there's a little bitty car sitting right in the middle of that. Does everybody have the little bitty car? We good on that part? Great. We are still, I'm going to leave the background part of it off. We don't need it anymore. I'm still working on the car, the jump layer, the layer number one. You can tell I'm working on it because it's highlighted. You see it's a lighter gray. Um, Photoshop actually used to slightly color this, which made it a lot easier to see, but nonetheless, that indicates the layer that you're actually working on. You still see I've got those white brackets around it, indicating that I am working on this. This is the one I'm working on. We're going to do a transform again, Command-T. We're going to, again, lock the link between the width and the height, and we are again going to drag across that height number. You could do it on the width number, either one, doesn't matter which one. <clears throat> and you want to type in 2,000, 2,000%. 2000 so two, two, three, hit the enter key once, and then hit it a second time. This is called destructive transforming. We just brought the car back up to its original height. The reason we did 2,000 was when we went from 100 down to 5%, it's a 20th of the size. If we go from 100% up to 2,000, it increases it 20 times. So we've just come back to it. But that is a destructive move, I think you'll agree. If you turn on the eyeball for the car that's underneath it, and then turn on the eyeball of that top layer or not, you will see that transforming can be a very destructive move. Did this happen to everyone? Did you fuck up your file? <whistles> yes sirree, right? Good for us. Um, this is horrible for us, especially when we get into serious compositing, because in compositing, there are a lot of times where you have elements that you're rescaling over and over and over and again. To if you're taking a figure and you're trying to put it into a background and you want to move it back in space, you change its scale. You want to bring it back forward again, you change its scale again. You try to line it up with something you realize that you forgot, you know, whatever. You can do them over and over and over again and every transform is a destructive move and eventually your figure looks like this. That's not going to work for us. So throw the car layer away the top one, the layer number one. We're going to start from scratch again, command J to make a copy of it, but this time we're going to turn this thing into a smart object. To do this, there's a couple of places to do it. The first place in the way I normally go to, the easiest way to learn this, is up to the layer menu, down to smart objects, convert to smart object. So again, look up my screen to see where I'm at. So layer, smart objects, convert to smart object, and let go. 
And what you'll notice has happened, it's a little bit hard to see on this, but if you, again, if you've made your, uh, your icons, your thumbnails, and your layers palette big enough, you'll notice that there's a weird little icon in the lower right-hand corner of that layer. That little icon indicates that, you, that this is a smart object. So what I have just done, imagine this is a, not a girl, but this is a car. What I have just done was created this protective envelope and I've put the car into the protective envelope. Does that make sense, everyone? So I want you to hit the B key right now to get a paintbrush and hover over your screen and you will notice you can't do anything. You get a circle with a line through it. You cannot paint on a smart object. It is protected. You cannot paint on this guy. You can't clone this guy. You, there's a lot of stuff that you can't do. You can't Healy brush this guy. You can't patch tool this guy. It's all protected as long as it's in here. However, there are a lot of things that you can do to this guy and transforming is one of them. So we're, go. So again, up to the layer menu, down to smart objects, to convert to smart object. And you got that weird little icon in the lower right hand corner, right? No, we're going to find out. So we're going to transform this guy. Same thing we did before. Command T to bring up the transform dialog box. Click on the link between width and height. Type in 5% for either one of them. Hit the enter key two times to actually apply that. And you will see that we've still got now, again, the little bitty car. But now we're going to transform the smart object again. So I'm going to hit Command, sorry, Command T. And look what has happened. Unlike the original version where these percentages of width and height reset to 100, these remember exactly where you are at. So in our case right now, click on the link between width and height, click on either one of them and put in 100%. We're going to go back to that, hit the enter key twice, and we have the car back again unmolested because it was a smart object. It was protected. Does that make sense to everyone? How many of you people in this room can paint with filters? Ever tried to do that? Do you guys ever blur an image or sharpen an image? Ever tried painting with it? We can paint with this as long as it's a smart object. I need everybody to come up to the filter menu and come down to blur and come down to Gaussian Blur, and let's really whack this brother. Let's put in a Gaussian Blur of 100 pixels. Looks pretty good to me. And say OK. So you got a really blurred image, and that's it. That's all I got for you guys today. Have a great time. Don't let the snow bite you in the ass. I'll see you next week. No. Um, look what's actually happened in your layer stack. You've actually now got, typically, that's a destructive move when you blur something. You can't come back from it. But you can't destroy a smart object. You can't do that. You've got now smart filters. We've actually got the blur is sitting right beneath it. If you come down here and turn off the eyeball for the blur, you see the image isn't destroyed at all. The blur is this illusion that is being applied to the smart object. But the car inside is still there. Even better, right above it is a mask. And the mask is actually functions for the filter. So if you click on the mask, again, you will see the little white border lines go around it. So the mask of the smart filter, we're just going to invert it. Hit Command I. That turns black to white or white to black. Now we have masked out the blur, and so we don't see it. Again, black conceals, white reveals. If we hit Command I again, we will actually bring the full car is blurring back again. Make sense? Hit Command I one more time to make sure the mask is black. Hit the B key to get a brush. I'm going to keep my brush about the size that we had before. We need to make sure that our foreground and background colors are at their defaults. To do that, the keyboard shortcut is the D key for default. If you can't remember that, see that little icon that's sitting right above the foreground color? It's a miniature version of the foreground background. If you click on that, it will also default your colors to black and white. I'm going to leave white as my foreground color, and I am going to, again, paint on this smart filter mask, 
and I'm just going to paint over the back of the car. And you can see I can actually blur the car in different stages. Make sense? I'm going to hit Command Z to undo that. And instead of doing it that way, I'm going to change the flow of my brush. Now, flow works like uh, airbrush. It's a, it applies the brush ink over a period of time, and it'll allow us to build something up slowly. This would be the one time to actually use a tablet. If you drop your flow down to like 5%, flow is something you got to get way down. So again, my options palette, 5%, and then just start scrubbing over parts of the car. And you'll see you can actually control. Now that's happening really quick for me, so I'm gonna hit Command Z to undo it. And I'm gonna drop my flow down to like 2%, 1%, 2%, somewhere in there. And then scrub over the car. And you can see you are actually painting with a blur filter. It gets better. So I'm gonna paint and fuck up my car pretty good like that. Smart filters are editable. They are remembered the value you put into them. If you come down to this Gaussian Blur smart filter and double click on it, it opens back up and it remembers the value that you put in at 100. You can actually change this now, crank it back to like five and say, okay. And this never goes away. This is saved with your files. Change your life. Are we good on this part? It gets better. You can close up the car. We will deal with smart objects to death in this class. They're one of the most powerful things that we can employ. And I'm gonna show you the last part of it right now. And we're doing pretty good time-wise. Hopefully I'm gonna get a chance to get to um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, showing you monitor calibration. If not, I've got to get through this part because this is a big part of your homework. As a matter of fact, and I say this to everybody, I can't believe this happens, but I'll say it to you guys right now. We're actually going to do a part of your homework right now. So do not sit there on your phone. Don't sit there looking and watching. Don't sit there and wait. Actually do this. And if you get through it all, you can actually turn it in and you'll get 100 on this part of your homework, which is a great thing to do, right? Okay, so it's this. Go back into your session number two files. And inside that session two files, there is a file called Bruce Fraser copyright 2005.dng. Um, this is a file, it's actually an exercise file from a book written by a guy that I think is like, he's one of the gods of, 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 of Photoshop. Unfortunately, he's dead. Um, but uh, I learned more from this man than probably, uh, anyway, if I had the chance to tell him thanks, I would. Um, anyway, it opens up, it's a DNG, it's a raw file, it opens up into camera raw. The problem that we've got right now is, is that I don't know if this is actually the un, uh, because it is a DNG, again, unlike a, a true raw file that, or not a true raw file, because a DNG is a true raw file. It's just that the XMP file that we have for a regular like CR2 file, a regular Photoshop, I mean a regular Canon file, a regular Nikon raw file, instead of having that XMP be separate as a sidecar file, the DNG just fakes it. it. It really is two files. They are still two separate files, but it wraps it into a single wrapper that makes it look like one file. So you never lose the sidecar file. It stays with it. But I need to start at the very beginning of this. So to get to the un anything, to undo anything that's actually been done to this file, come to the little three lines that are on the far right hand side the little three dots that are at the bottom of the, of the, uh, um, of the uh, tool part that's on the far right hand side. Click on that and your second option is to reset to default. And if you click on reset to default, you should end up with a really sort of washed out image. Everybody got that guy? Okay. In our setup right now, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you should see you have a cancel button, a done button, and an open button. Is that what everyone has? We're going to change that. We want to work with smart objects at this stage of the game because smart objects, you can actually embed a copy of your raw data into the smart object that gives you access to that forevermore, even if you don't have that raw file anymore. If you only have this Photoshop file, there is a copy of the raw data inside of it as long as we put it in to a smart object. But we need to do that at this stage of the game. 
This is the stage of the game where we're getting ready to go from camera raw into Photoshop. We need that smart object creation to happen at that stage of the game. So to do that, you'll see at the very bottom of your window, there's a hyperlink that mine right now says Adobe RGB 1998 8-bit, and it gives the pixel dimension size of it. Again, if you click on that hyperlink, it will open up your Camera Raw preferences. And this basically is telling you not only how you can set up the Camera Raw space itself, but also how you want to bring stuff into Photoshop. So, just as a quick check going through all of this, the things that you do or don't want to do. If you're a person who prefers to work in Profoto RGB because it's a bigger color space, I will argue that that's a mistake. But if you do, this is how you would change it. However, if you do change it, you also need to change the bit depth here from 8-bit to 16 because 8 bits is not enough information to describe the size of Profoto's uh, space adequately. If you wanted to work in sRGB for some reason, again, this is where you would change that part. But we're going to leave ours at Adobe RGB. We are going to leave it at 8 bits per channel. We're not going to change the upsize. This is where you could <clears throat> upside your, upsize your image or downsize your image and do it based on the raw data. Again, this is not something we want to do on this part right now. We, when we, if we need to get into that later, we will. However, output sharpening, this is absurd to have this at this stage of the game right now because output sharpening has everything to do with what you're going to do with the file. How do you know? If you're going to use this file, I think of them as master files. If you're going to use this file to make a print for your portfolio and also be a, a, a go onto your website as a JPEG, those are two completely different sharpening routines that you use for this. Why on earth you would set this up and do this in the beginning is beyond me. You should never touch that part. However, down at the bottom, this open in Photoshop as smart objects, you want to enable that and leave it that way and say, OK. You'll now notice that that open button no longer says open. It says open object. If for some reason you temporarily needed to go back to opening a normal file, not as a smart object, simply hold down your shift key and you'll see that little button changes back to open instead of open object. But for our purposes here, we want this to open as a smart object. So then simply click on open object. You'll see that you've got that cute little corner thing down in the bottom part right here. It looks great. To get back into the raw data to edit it again, simply double click on the thumbnail of that layer and you will go right back into Camera Raw where you can actually change the settings again. Now, I am going to tell you how to develop this file because I want to demonstrate. Well, let me ask you guys really quickly. How do you guys dodge and burn? Oh, come on, I know all the tricks. Some of you use a soft light layer. Some of you use a curve for burning, a curve for dodging. Some of you actually use the, dur the dodge and burn tool. Does anybody in this room not know what I mean by dodging and burning? I usually use a copy of the layer and a mask. Copy of the layer and a mask. That's sort of where we're heading, but what does a copy of the layer do? How do you, don't you change it somehow? Yeah, don't worry. We're going we're gonna to do what you maybe think you're doing, but on steroids. But anyway, I'm going to show you guys the real way to actually dodge and burn, and it's based on raw data. Your raw data is the most powerful stuff that you've got. Once you bring a file into Photoshop that isn't raw data anymore, like we've done with the car, once the car is brought in like that, that raw data is not available to us anymore. That's called a baked file. You can, yes, you can make it lighter and you can make it darker, but you are running the risk of fracturing it tonally, you're running the risk of banding, you're running the risk of pixelization. There's a whole series of risks that you run because you are actually trying to push around data that's already basically set into place. That's not what happens to your raw data. Your raw data you get to process and you can process your raw data over and over and over again. Does that make sense? How many people in this room have used Photoshop for more than three years? So, I don't know if you guys remember this, but Photoshop, the version of Camera Raw has changed considerably over the years. Even this version right now that we've got right here 
is considerably different than it actually used to be, uh, as, uh, like only a year or two ago, right? Every iteration of Photoshop Camera Raw that has come out has had a different processing engine in it, a different way to actually process a file. And this is true of anybody who uses, there are people here who use Capture One. Capture One, every major update to Capture One is really driven by a rewrite of the processing engine, which means that if you process in version 12, you'll have a, a file that looks somewhat different than version 20 and radically different than version 6. I need to, when I originally did this, there was a different version of Photoshop Camera Raw. So the numbers that I'm going to give you, because I'm going to give you the numbers to put in for this, to reprocess this file, but they work for a different version of Camera Raw, and we need to use that version of Camera Raw. So this is how you get to it. So currently, right now, it would always process using the latest and greatest. But if you collapse your um, uh, sidebars over here so that you can see all of them, come down to calibration. And in calibration, you will see at the very top. So again, calibration was the very final of the panels on the right-hand side. Calibration, you'll see the process. And in here, we've got version 5 current. If you click on this drop-down menu, it will tell you what the other versions of this are. And I could have sworn I had this in my notes, but I'm fairly certain. Oh, this is version two is the version that we need to actually pick. So I need you to come down to version two and go ahead and select that. And now if you come up to your basic panel, you'll notice that things have changed radically. That you've now got exposure, you've got recovery, fill light, blacks, brightness, contrast. You didn't have that before in the current version that did not exist right so has everybody got this because if you do not see fill light you have not picked the right one everybody got this all right i'm going to give you the values to plug into this because it just makes this process faster i've actually processed this file <clears throat> so People make this mistake in this class a lot. They think that the values that I'm going to give you right now are the values that you would use for every single file. They're not. These are specific to this file alone. So these are not numbers to write down. These are simply numbers to end. This is how I processed this file. It has no relationship to any other file in the world. Does that make sense? So these are not sacred numbers. These are just the numbers that I did when I processed it to begin with. Okay. So we're going to start at the very top, and I'm going to start with color temperature. But when I do, as long as I do, and as long as I'm here, I would like to point out whether th one other thing. If you look at color temperature, what color is this right here on this side of color temperature? What color is this on the other side? What color is this side on tint? What color is this side? Sounds like LAB to me. Lightness is exposure. A channel, B channel. You've been using LAB your whole life, and you never knew it. Actually, this is not, to, to be fair, this is not identical. This is actually cocked slightly on the color wheel, but it's really damn close. And it functions the same way. So at any rate, if you select the color temperature value, so just drag across the color temperature, we're going to use the tab key to simply move down. And so I'm going to give you a value to put in tell you to hit the tab key, it'll take you to the very next thing and you can just type in the value, just easier way to move. So for the color temperature, I want you to put in 6800, hit the tab key. You can leave a plus seven for the tint, hit the tab key. For your exposure, I want you to drag it down. It's hard for me to type in negatives, but I need a minus 0.95. So not quite a minus one, but a minus 0.95. Hit the tab key for recovery, you can leave that at zero. Hit the tab key for fill, you can leave that at zero. Hit the tab key for the blacks, I want you to type in 18. Hit the tab key for the brightness, 81. Hit the tab key for contrast, 56. Don't worry, we'll go over these a second time. Hit the tab key for, uh, yep, clarity, 52. Hit the tab key for vibrance, 35. Hit the tab key for saturation, zero. So we will go through these again. Color temperature up at the top, 6,800. Tint under it, plus seven. Exposure under it, minus 0.95. Recovery under that, zero. Fill light under that, zero. Blacks under that, 
18. Brightness under that, 81. Contrast under that, 56. Clarity under that, 52. Vibrance under that, 35. And saturation, 0. Are we good on this? Say what? No, clarity, yeah, clarity is 52. Vibrance is 35. You good? Yeah. And then hit OK. And this is going to come in. I am actually going to double click on the name of the layer right down here to rename it for what it is. And I'm going to actually call this uh, grass. Because that's what it's been developed for. This was not developed for anything. It's sort of the grass. It's the landscapey part. But using the word landscape is too vague. So I'm not going to use that part. So here's the thing. And this is the thing that will trip you up in this. So this next part, you got to pay really close attention to. Because if you get it, you will have one of the most powerful things in the world to work with. If you don't get this, you'll just be frustrated. And you'll have to watch this video again to figure out what's going on. Yes. Zero. Okay, so here's the deal. I want to make a copy of this layer and reprocess it for the sky. So I'm going to hit Command J. That will make a copy of it, just like I said. And then I'm going to double click on this top one to go back into Camera Raw to reprocess it. Does that make sense? Now, shoot. Oh, it'll be it same control J. Or if not, just drag the file down to the yeah, okay. So I'm not gonna waste the time to go into this a lot because I just want to show you the problem with this. I want you to just grab the exposure slider and pull it all the way down. And then say okay. And what you'll see has happened is this. It's not that just the version that I just did that of changed. But look at the one that's underneath it. It changed them both. What's happening to this is, this is my smart object. So the raw data, I put it in here. This is my raw data. And I stuck it in here. And everything was great. I made my, uh, my adjustments in camera raw. And then I brought it in here. And everything was fine. But copying a layer the way we just copied, what it does is it just makes another reference to this exact same smart object. These are not two separate smart objects. They are two references to a single smart object. So any change that I make to one changes them both. And this can go on forever. I can make a thousand of these. Now, people always say to me, well, God, that seems like such a poor design. Why would you do that? And I always say to them, imagine being a wallpaper designer and you design a piece of wallpaper that's got a thousand butterflies on a panel and you do a thousand layers of it and the art director comes to you and says, yeah, it'd be great if that one wing was just down a little bit, right? Well, then you're faced with having to change a thousand layers. If you do it as, these are true clones. This is called true cloning. If you do it as a true clone, you just open up this one smart object, you change the wing down a little bit and all thousand of them are changed the exact same way. Does that sort of make sense? Don't worry, we don't design wallpaper in this in this class. Um, we need to go back in space and do this the correct way. Hit Command J to, I mean, Command Z to undo that. So it'll just take us back. Throw away that second layer that you just made, because again, it's a true clone of the original one, and that's not what we want. What we want is a discrete, separate, smart object to do the sky. To do that, there's only one way to do it. Come up to the Layer menu. Come down to Smart Objects and down to New Smart Object via Copy. If you do not remember anything else in this class, you've got to remember this. Take out your phone and take a picture of it. I should have this tattooed on my ass. I keep looking for the right thing. There's a lot of things that are meaningful to me in life. I don't know that this really is that up there. But at any rate, does this make sense to everybody, what we're talking about here? This is how you make a copy of the raw data as a discrete, separate smart object. So it doesn't look any different than it did before. It looks identical, but it is completely different. So now 
double click on the, again, the top smart object to open it up. And I'm going to give you a new set of numbers to actually put in for this. So actually, we're going to do, we've got enough time here. We're going to do two more of these. We're going to do one for the castle and then one for the sky as well. So I'm going to do the castle one first. So for the castle one, again, select the color temperature at the very top. It's actually going to remain 6800, so you can just leave it that way. Hit the tab key. The plus 7 for the tent is fine. We're going to leave that as well. For the exposure, I want you to drag that down to a minus 1.5. Hit the tab key. For recovery, type in 52. Hit the tab key. For the fill, put in 27. Hit the tab key. For the blacks, put in 16. Hit the tab key for the brightness, 91. Hit the tab key for the contrast, 68. Hit the tab key for the um, clarity, 100. Hit the tab key, 0 for uh, vibrance, and the tab key, 0 for saturation. So I will go through them again. Your color temperature is at 6800. Your tint is at plus 7. Your exposure is a minus 1.5. Your recovery <clears throat> is 52. Your fill light is 27. Your blacks are 16. Your brightness is 91. Your contrast is 68. Clarity is plus 100. Zero vibrance and zero saturation and say OK. Now what this file has been done is processed just for the castle. If you want to see the difference between it and the grass, first off, double click on the name for that layer and call it castle. And then simply turn its eyeball on and off. And you can see, ignore what it did to the grass, ignore what it did to the sky. We are just processing this for the castle. Everybody good on that part? All right, turn the eyeball back on. Yes. Hang on. Between not hearing you and not anything else. No, it's just easier. So what? Oh, they're just zero, both okay. zero. Sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. I no, that's okay. That's okay. It's why I have this. Hopefully, everybody got on the sign-in sheet, right? Um, it's why I have this little speaker. I, fuck, nobody can hear anybody with, without masks, with masks on. This is just ridiculous. So hopefully, you know, this helps. Okay, we're going to do this one more time. Again, I need to make another copy of my raw data. So again, I can't use Command J because that will only clone this layer, and that is not what I want. I want a completely separate of my raw data to do just the sky. So again, up to the layer menu, down to Smart Objects, down to New Smart Object via Copy. This is exactly what we did when we made the castle layer. It'll make another layer for you. It's called Castle Copy. Before I actually edit it, I'm going to just double click on it and call it Sky. And then I'm going to double click on that smart object to open it back up into Camera Raw. And I'm going to give you another new set of numbers. So up at the very top again for color temperature, select that because we're going to change it. We're going to change that to 4700, 4700. Hit the tab key, tent can stay at plus 7. Hit the tab key, the exposure can stay at minus 1.5. Hit the tab key for recovery, we need to go to 96. Hit the tab key for fill, we're going to go to zero. Hit the tab key for blacks, we're going to go to 32. Hit the tab key for brightness, we're going to go to 60. Hit the tab key for contrast, six. Hit the tab key for clarity, 100. Hit the tab key for vibrance, zero. Hit the tab key, saturation is also zero. So let me go through these numbers again for you. Color temperature, 4,700. Tint, 7. Exposure, minus 1.5. Recovery, 96. Fill light, 0. Blacks, 32. Brightness, 60. Contrast, 6. Clarity, 
plus 100, vibrance 0, saturation 0. And you can see what I've done here. I'm ignoring everything else. I'm simply developing this for the sky. That's why my recovery is so far up. That's why my contrast is so far low. I don't want to blow out all the little fraction, the, the, the whatever midtone mint tones that I've actually gotten here. I certainly don't want to push them around anymore, whatever. So this is all about developing for the sky. And I'm going to go, okay. So once we've got this, you can actually see we've got three layers right now. Again, I'm going to double click on the hand just to get this as big as it can possibly be. If I click on the eyeball that's actually next to the sky and turn it off, you can see what I now see is the layer that was developed for the castle. And then if I come down to the bottom and I turn off, so I turn off both the, the first layer, I mean the top layer and the middle layer, then what I see is a development for the grass. So now I actually need to put these guys together and you do that using layer masks. Again, layer masks, just like we saw before when we were looking at the red car and we had the green and the red car and we were doing mixes of both. Well, that's what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna do a mix of both of these. So we are going to spend an inordinate of, oh God, I used to be able to speak English. I used to be able to speak English. I was actually an English major in, high, in uh, college. I wanted to be a doctor. Wow. Um, I went to Italy and I didn't learn how to speak. It I lived in Italy for seven years. I didn't learn how to speak Italian well, but I forgot how to speak English. So um, I just all got fucked up, but at any rate. Yeah, okay, so my feeling about this class and that we are going to spend, like I said, a great deal of effort in this class learning how to make the most incredible selections that you've ever made in your life. Most of you guys struggle with selecting stuff. Most of you trust a lot of the tools that are in here uh, and some stuff will get you started. Some stuff will be pretty good or whatever. But my feeling about this is that if you can make the perfect selection, you can do anything in Photoshop. And so a big part of this is showing you and, and the myriad of ways that we use to make incredibly uh, detailed and effective selections. That's not what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna do kind of the hack job you're probably normally used to doing, um, and then we'll fix the hack job that we do this week, next week. But at least we'll get, and at least you'll see the overall idea about how this works. So the first tool that I'm actually gonna use, I'm gonna turn on my top layer right here. So the sky, I'm gonna actually turn it on. I wanna select the sky. And now, how would you guys select the sky? What, where, what would be your go-to? Oh, come on, I know all about you guys. It's a quick selection tool. There's no, there's no tool in the fucking arsenal of Photoshop that made people more lazy than the quick selection tool. And you all use it, right? Own it, I use it too. I'm not above you guys, I'm no different than you guys. I'm right down in the pit with you. But quick selection tool, that's what everybody uses. That would be the first thing to do. So at least we need to learn how to use it correctly. So what does the quick selection tool do? It actually looks for edges. That's all it does. And so you need to learn how to use it correctly so that it does what you want it to do. But you need to understand what the tool is really doing. So it's looking for an edge. So this is the first mistake that people make. I'm going to grab the quick selection tool. If you do it, it's over on your toolbar. Fourth tool down is a dropout menu, a, a dropout to give you other options, other possibilities. And this version of, in my version of the software, I have the object selection tool, quick selection tool, and the magic wand tool. I'm going to select the quick selection tool. Again, my eyes immediately go up to the top to check to see if there's any options that I need to change on this guy. And what you'll notice is that up in the options, there are three little icons. One is a conventional selection tool. The way conventional selection tools work, you make a selection, then if you make another selection, it gets rid of the original one you made. In order to actually have selections add cumulatively, you normally have to hold down the shift key to do that. In the quick selection tool, by default, it selects the one that's got the little plus. So we can start the tool and move it around to different places and it will just continue to add more and more and more to the selection. Or you can select the final one on there, the one that's got the little minus on it, which would be the equivalent of actually holding down the option key. You'll see what that is in just a second. Yes? I don't know if this is like the 2022 update, but I only have object selection. So you don't have quick selection tool? Yeah, I used to. Okay, no, that's where I'm going to show you how to get it back. Okay. So if you don't have it, if you guys are missing any of these tools, 
come up to your edit menu, come down to toolbar at the very bottom. And in your case, I would just hit restore defaults. I'm going to do the same on mine because mine are fucked up too. And then go to, back to that and see if you end up with a quick selection tool. No? Lasso and object. Uh, and we can also change this. We can add it if it's not there. So it'll be on this side over here. It's not over here, so it's actually someplace else in this screen. Oh, I take that. It's right there. Uh, and so it should be in here. Okay, sorry. Right it's okay. Out. It's all right. Okay, so the tool looks for edges. So I'm going to go after the sky right here. I'm going to bring the tool over onto my screen. Again, I'm going to use the keys just to, the bracket keys just to the right of the P key to make my quick selection tool a little bit larger. Not too large. Again, the trick to this tool is you do not ever want to touch the edge you want it to find. So I want it to find this horizon line. That's what I want it to find. And actually where the sky meets the castle, that's where I want it to find. But look at this image. The image that I've got is so fucking dark. It's like there's no, I don't have any, I, I, I've got a line I can see, but I don't have a really good solid line that I can see, right? I don't have a real contrast between the sky and everything else. Turn off your sky eyeball much better place to use the quick selection tool. I've got a really defined line now. The only one I'm looking at, my only eyeball is on the um, bottom layer. You should select the bottom layer to run the tool on, even though you'll get the preview part of it. You want to be working on this. But this gives me a much stronger contrast line to actually use this tool. I know people who will go in and put curves on uh, their images just to boost the contrast in order to make the tool work better and then throw the curve away. Make sense? So then to use the tool, I'm going to start in the upper left-hand corner and I'm going to click and start to drag across the right. What you don't want to do, look up at my screen really quickly here, is this. If you cross this line, it starts looking for the next line down, which it finds in this grass. That is not what you want to do with this tool. You never touch the line you want it to find. So I'm going to hit Command Z to undo that. And I'm going to simply come across. And it does a selection of my castle. And it's relatively good. Again, we are going to refine this selection next week. But for me right now, I'm going to accept this for the selection that it's actually made. I'm going to turn on my sky. I'm also going to make my sky active because we are going to apply a layer mask to it. And then since I've got an active selection going, all I need to do is click on the add layer mask icon at the bottom of my layers palette. It's the square, well, the rectangle that's got a little black hole in the middle of it. Click on that and it will apply a layer mask based on that selection. And you can see the layer mask right here. If you want to see the layer mask by itself, hold down the Option key and click on it, and you can see. So what the mask is now doing is, is it's hiding the castle and the grass on this layer, only showing the sky. That's exactly what we wanted to have happen. Make sense? And then if you want to see the whole show again, simply click back on the image. So right away, I have actually now blended these two in, and I have got I, anybody in here. I defy anybody in here to tell me you can dodge and burn this well. It gets better. It gets better. I'm going to go after the <clears throat> castle right now. I'm going to turn off the sky. Again, I'm looking for a stronger contrast line between the, uh, the, um, uh, the clouds and everything else. I'm going to make my brush, my quick selection tool smaller. I'm also going to zoom in. The keyboard court shortcut that I use for zooming is this. If you hold down the space bar and the command on Mac, space bar, control on Windows, it's the two that are right next to each other, you will temporarily get the magnifying glass no matter what tool you have. So you don't have to get rid of the tool you've got. 
you will simply get the plus magnifying glass. If you add the option key, you get the negative one. So it's a quick way to zoom in and zoom out without losing the quick selection tool. Because if you let go of everybody, it still is the quick selection tool. So I'm gonna zoom into the castle a little bit more. Seems good enough right here. I'm gonna make my tool a little bit, my brush quick selection tool a little bit smaller. Again, you don't want this thing to touch anything. So if I need to actually draw this edge of the castle, it has to be small enough so that it doesn't hit either the, cloud, the sky or the bushes that are on the lower part. So I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller to get into this area. And I'm gonna click and I'm just gonna start to go around the castle part. Now it's grabbing a lot of the grass. I'm okay with that right now because I can refine that part a little bit more. And I've got the whole, the whole um, castle is now selected. However, <clears throat> I've got too much of the heather grass in the front part, and I've got a little bit that's on the edge over there. So to get rid of that, move your quick selection tool to the outside. If you hold down the option key, you will see that the little plus that was inside of the quick selection tool changes to a minus. And then what you wanna do, I'm gonna zoom in way, I need everybody to look up my screen up here really quick again. I'm holding down to get the minus. I'm gonna sweep it down across this, but again, you do not want the tool to touch the castle. Let the tool do its work. It will actually try to find an edge. So I stay away from the castle and simply drop down and it gives me the castle part. That part is in good shape. I'm then going to do the same thing to get rid of the grass that it's selected on the ground. But again, you do not want to touch any of the brick of the castle with this tool. So I'm gonna hold down the option key, start to drag along. It will actually use its brains to actually find it. To move my image when I'm zoomed in this much, if you hold down only the space bar, any tool that you have will temporarily turn into the hand and allow you to move things around. So again, option key down and just start to get rid of all the grass that was selected in that. Do not touch any of the brick. If you do, your selection will go up into the brick and then you'll be actually going in the opposite direction again, which we don't wanna do. And I look like I've got a pretty decent selection on this part going on right now. Yep. I'm going to double click on the hand now to zip back out. I'm going to select my middle layer right now. I'm going to turn my middle layer, which is the castle. I'm going to turn the eyeball on so it's visible to me. The castle is selected. So now if I add a layer mask to this, it puts a layer mask on that only reveals the castle. So here, look at my screen really quick. This is what my mask looks like. You can see I've got an anomaly that's right down here on the bottom of my mask. You see this little line down here? This is something that's in the bushes. Um, it doesn't matter. I can fix this at this stage of the game. I'm just going to hit the B key to get my brush. I'm going to hit the X key to make black my foreground color. And I'm simply going to paint over this when I drag my flow all the way back up. I'm just going to paint that mistake out and I'm good to go. So now if I turn all three layers on, double click the hand, this is the final image. And think about where it was when we started. But here's the beauty. I need you to save this image right now. This is going to be part of your homework. So, and there's a naming convention for the homework. You don't need to name it right now. Well, you can name it right now. I don't know what the assignment number is, uh, but it would start with your last name. And the assignment is, actually, I can tell you right now. Name this file. It will be named your last name, underscore, first name, underscore, 2.4. That's the assignment number. And we will turn this in next week. You do not need to turn it in right now. But I want you to actually go ahead and save this guy. I'm gonna save mine to my toss folder. <clears throat> Don't save yours to your toss folder. Yes, it's your last name, mm -hmm. underscore, first name, underscore, 2.4. That's the assignment number. All right, I need everybody to, now that you've saved it, I need you to close it. And the image is not there anymore. Yes?
Okay, do me a favor, hang on, because we got five minutes to go on this. And no, no, I'll get you back, don't worry. It'll, it'll, it'll only take a second. Um, so did everybody save this and close it up, right? We good on this part? I need you to open that file. Yes. Oh, no, you actually, no, I thank you for saying that. It should be saved as a Photoshop file. So I'm going to open mine back up because I don't remember what I even saved mine as. So in the drop down menu here, in this drop down menu, you want to do it as a Photoshop file. You can do it as a TIFF file. They're pretty much interchangeable. Anyway, close the file up and then I want you to open it up again. So again, just go up to file, recent. It should be at the very top. Whatever you named yours is what will be at the very top. You should have your three versions, your three layers. Everybody's got that. I want you to go down to the very bottom layer and double click on it. The thumbnail. This is a copy of your raw data with all the development settings sitting there. Hit cancel. If it says save changes, just say no. We didn't make any changes. Oh, you fucker. If I could find the engineer, just hit OK. If I could find the engineer that does Photoshop, the group, I would like firebomb them. Um, go up to the next layer. Double click on the thumbnail of the second layer. These are the, this is a second copy of your raw data that is processed completely different. Hit OK. And then finally go up to the third one. A third copy of your raw data with its settings embedded in a Photoshop file that you will never lose. Try fucking doing that in Lightroom. The thing that you do in Lightroom that only remembers your final edit, whatever it is, it doesn't remember multiple sets of edits, much less combine them together. You, you could throw away the Bruce Fraser raw data file right now. As long as you had this file, you still have all of your raw data intact with all its individual uh, um, 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 uh, settings for different exposure parts of this. There is nothing that is as powerful as this when it comes to dodging and burning. You will be able to do shit that nobody knows can be done. Are there questions about this? All right. Um, that's it, guys. So for next week, um, again, reading through the homework assignment, there is four shootings. Well, we can look at them really quick. Let me cancel out here. We'll just take a quick run at it. Uh, in your assignment folder, that's where all of it will be. Uh, in your assignment folder, there is uh, um, one, two, yeah, there's three different uh, shootings, four different uh, shootings right here. I'm asking you to go in and create a um, um, uh, 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 DNG profile, color custom profile for each one of those individual ones. And then to also create a DNG where you apply that profile and you also white balance the image as well. Um, all the instructions, if you take a look at the uh, assignment file right here, it'll walk you through this part really great right here. Oh, and in these instructions is the path for Windows people of where those camera profiles are. So let me open this up really quickly. Remember, I showed them to you for Mac and I said I don't know where they are for uh, PC. So this is where they are right here for PC. This is where you actually go to find um, uh, those camera raw profiles that you're going to turn in. Are we good on this part? All right, guys. Um, I'm going to see what's going on over here. But other than that, I'm going to stop the recording and I'll see you guys next week. Stay unsnowed tomorrow.